All right. There we go. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the live stream of this Monday's SIP Symposium. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Matthias von Binswergen, and I'm the Commissioner of Intellectual Activities of the Dutch United Nations Student Association, SIP Groningen. For those of you who are new, SIP hosts weekly lectures and other intellectual activities almost every Monday throughout the academic year. These activities are organized by me, our committees, our project groups, or as tonight by our disputa, Boof and Max Havelos. Typically, Boof and Max Havelos are responsible for project group Diplomats Dinner and project group Europe, respectively. However, due to unforeseen circumstances, our annual trip to Brussels and annual Diplomats Dinner couldn't go through. Instead, the disputa joined forces to bring you tonight's online activity, Deconstructing the European Parliament, moderated by yours truly. So on their behalf and on behalf of Sip Groningen, I'm truly honored to introduce to you our two speakers for tonight. Lauren Stasse, president of Volt Nederland and first uh, candidate of, for the parliamentary elections this March, and John Edward, former candidate for the European Union, former head of the Scot the European the European Parliament of the Office of the European Parliament in Scotland. So please, uh, before we begin, a, a short virtual round of applause, please. <laughs> Thank you very much for joining us. Um, so before we begin, um, I will short, I just want to give a quick rundown of what the evening will look like for everyone. Um, so shortly I'll allow each expert to introduce themselves, but before we begin, uh, I will explain everything. So after the introductions, we move to a rather loose discussion format guided by questions which are prepared by our dispute in Buf and Max Havlos. Um, however, it will remain uh, somewhat of a free discussion. So if you have any questions throughout the lecture, I would ask you to send them to me by clicking on my name in the Zoom chat or by just typing them into the YouTube live stream comments. Um, these questions uh, I will ask to I'll ask you to put them yourselves at the end. Um, so if you submit a question um, via Zoom during the Q&A section after the discussion, I will uh, ask you to unmute yourself and put your questions. So please send in your questions throughout the evening so that by the time we reach the segment and try to devote to Q&A, we'll have some questions prepared. Now, without further ado, I will hand over the words to our, our first expert who's joining us today, our first politician rather, Laron Stassen. Uh, Laurens, could you shortly tell the audience a little bit about Volt Europa, a little about your background and what it means to be the first lifestrecker of Volt Nederland? Yeah, certainly. Um, uh, amazing to be here tonight in this digital uh, audience. Uh, I really like that uh, this evening is also co-hosted uh, by uh, Twee Disputen, um, which I think is really cool that a lot of young people are interested in the European politics uh, and want to get to know more about it. Um, so I'm really happy that I can uh, join you here tonight in this hopefully interesting evening and a cool discussion. Um, my name is uh, Lanus Dossen. Um, I studied myself in, uh, in Nijmegen um, and also uh, did the, the Model United Nations. Um, also, uh, of course, uh, it was a cool thing to get to know uh, politics and to be a little bit more involved. Um, after my uh, uh, graduations uh, of my master strategy, I went to uh, uh, work in Amsterdam, uh, where I worked uh, on uh, money laundering and uh, terrorist financing for a bank, uh, and also more on the innovative side. Um, and then uh, I noticed myself that um, uh, looking to the outside world, I got a little bit more worried. Uh, I saw Brexit happening. I saw Trump. I saw Marie Le Pen. Uh, Salvini uh, in the Netherlands, the FAD, a more nationalistic sounds uh, were popping up. Um, and I thought, okay, where is this heading to? And then at a certain day, uh, I got a message uh, from uh, my dad and he sent me this news article, which stated new energy for Europe uh, as a headline. And I immediately got caught by the two first words, new energy. And I thought, this is really nice that a young generation of Europeans throughout Europe are establishing this new transnational political party, uh, the first of its kind, um, and to participate in the European elections because they said only a Europe that works together can solve the challenges of our time. Um, and I really got inspired by this. I thought it was a very logical way um, of um, uh, well, ma making politics. 
Um, and during that time, I got to learn also the founders, who was a French uh, girl, a German guy and an Italian guy. And they founded Volt after the Brexit because they said, what is happening uh, at this moment? We are living in one of the uh, wealthiest times. Uh, there are so big challenges. And for some odd reason, we are splitting up. Why is this happening? And one of the things that, and I think we will also go deep to in uh, this discussion this evening, one of the things that they saw is that even though the challenges of today are transnational and should be dealt at the European level, politics always has remained a national affair. Um, and they said, we want to change this and we want to lift up the politics to a European level. And so that's what I did. Um, and I joined them. Um, and the first uh, elections we participated were the European elections. Uh, we participated in eight different countries. Um, we got one seat at the European Parliament uh, from uh, Damian Beuselager. He is now sitting in the European Parliament for Whole Volt Europa. Um, and we got somewhere around uh, 900,000 uh, votes throughout Europe. And in the Netherlands, we got 2%, which um, uh, was really nice because we only were uh, getting started for 10 months in a row. Um, and that also 2% means three uh, seats for the national elections. So we're very hopeful uh, for March next year. Um, in the meanwhile, um, uh, we well, we're participated in more elections throughout Europe. Uh, we have participated in Bulgaria, in Italy and in Germany all for the local and regional parliaments. And we also have elected officials right there. And in the Netherlands, we are the first one to participate in uh, the national elections. So um, I used to be uh, the chairman of uh, the Netherlands and I got elected in June last uh, this year as a lead candidate. Um, so I'm uh, heading the list of uh, 28 very motivated uh, people aging from 19, who is the youngest, uh, Bibi, to uh, 72, who is the oldest, uh, Theo, um, with a lot of young people on the list and a lot of motivated lists to also change the way politics is done in the Netherlands. So that is a little bit of short introduction. Thank you. It's uh, quite the exciting start you had, just getting to know people who first started the movement and then now several votes, and now you're running for the Dutch parliament. Yeah, that's one of the really cool things. Uh, what I really like of Volt is that even if you join today, you can still immediately participate. Uh, participate in policy making, participate in the communication. We are doing participating campaigning. Um, so have, we are a grassroots movement. Um, so the aim is also that people can really contribute from the start when they, uh, when they join. Um, and that's also the reason I stayed with Volt because I joined for the idea, but I stayed because of the people and they inspired me uh, because they spent so much of their free time and their energy to to start something from the ground um, and yeah that, that's really amazing i i truly agree um but i think our other speaker for tonight is um waiting to have a word as well and i think he got a quite a different start in um uh, european politics so um john edward you have previously run for the European Parliament. Uh, you were previously the chief campaign spokesman for Scotland's Strong in Europe in 2016. And you were also uh, inspired after Brexit happened. So I was wondering if you could also tell us a bit about yourself, a bit about your background, and um, how, how come you decided to join us here today? Yeah, good evening. Um, good evening from a dark Scotland. Um, and uh, thanks for the invitation. Thank you to Hannah in particular for the invitation. Um, I, yeah, I'm a, I'm a rather old hand at this, uh, this European matter, at least it feels like now. Um, uh, but it's, it's interesting that even now, well, we're, we're 11 months through the transition period, we're effectively one calendar month away from our complete severing of relationships with the European Union, but it's still being discussed. So this this seminar follows what I did with Boulder, Colorado, just two weeks ago. So one lockdown and two technology is helping us keep talking about it. As you mentioned, I was a candidate in what were our last European elections last year. Um, indeed, we weren't supposed to have those elections because we were supposed to have been out by then. Um, but I felt that when the opportunity came, I ought to at least put myself forward for what was the 
then the Scottish Liberal Democratic Party, part of the reform group in, in the parliament. Um, and we, we had a good night, but the person who was elected was only there for another, whatever it was, five, six months. And then we formally left in January this year, as you know. Um, but my, probably the most active sort of campaigning role I've had in Europe, as you say, was in 2016, I was the chief spokesman for the Scottish end of the, the Remain campaign in the Brexit referendum. And if I have nothing else on my gravestone, on my epitaph, when I die, I will have, well, at least you won in Scotland, because we were, as you know, one of the two parts of the United Kingdom to vote to remain to stay. Indeed, Edinburgh, where I sit right now, voted 75% to stay. Um, but England and Wales voted to leave. And of course, the bigger numbers meant that we're leaving at the end of next month. Um, but that was a, an incredibly positive campaign in Scotland, very fact-based, not too much uh, discussion about the, the very British mythology about Europe and about power and about federalism and about all these things that drove Brexit down south. Of course, we're a very big, empty country, Scotland, so the immigration question really didn't happen up here. So that was a sad coda to my European time. As you mentioned, I was I ran the European Parliament's Information Office here in Scotland for six years, including uh, from 2004 to nine, I think, which included the last British presidency, as it turned out. Um, and that included running information campaigns for the European elections in 2004 and 2009. Um, which was interesting because although there's a, a latent internationalism interest in a country like Scotland as part of the UK in Europe, um, very, very low understanding from people generally of what they were voting for. It was treated as a bit of an opinion poll and it was probably a precursor actually to the vote that we had in 2016. That People didn't really take it seriously as part of their national uh, democratic structure. So maybe my efforts weren't as successful then as I'd hoped. But it was very difficult. I mean, trying to run an election campaign that has European messages from Portugal to Scotland to Latvia to Greece, very, very hard, because some places it works well, some places it sounds awful. Um, before that, I'd been in Brussels for 10 or so years, um, latterly for the Scottish representation there, which pre and post the recreation of the Scottish Parliament looked at how a, a devolved region could operate within the EU. And we were, in the beginning, we sat alongside our colleagues in Flanders, Bavaria, um, Catalonia, uh, to a certain extent, Northern Italy. Um, but by the end, because of the powers of the Scottish Parliament, we were probably one of the more um, preeminent legislative regions below a member state. Um, and of course, in 2014, we had a, a referendum to actually consider leaving the United Kingdom and, and staying in Europe as an independent country. It's interesting just to hear what Lawrence was saying about Volta, about where you are now. My first job in Brussels, as I mentioned to the, you before we started, was special assistant to Max Constam, who had been one of Jean Monnet's assistants from the late 40s onwards. And uh, Max had been, as an English-speaking Dutchman, had been the negotiator, had been sent off to speak to Edward Heath and Adam and to uh, Dulles in the United States and all sorts of people. Um, Max was very much of the belief that Britain was a formal part of Europe. He'd been at the Messina conference, he'd seen the whole thing through from the beginning. But one of the first things we were doing was writing position papers for the 96 governmental conference, which led to the Maastricht Treaty, which of course floated for the first time the idea of having pan-European parties which Volt sounds like it's an actual, one of the very first proper representations of. So it goes back a long way. Um, I, the last thing I would say is, I, I'm making myself sound like a very, very old man here. Um, but my awareness of Europe from the northwest corner of it started as a child, really. My father is still operating as a lawyer, a retired lawyer, and he was part of the the bars and law societies of Europe, which were set up in the 70s as an opportunity to bring the profession together and look at common standards and a precursor to the single market. So I remember as a little boy serving wine to what they were old men in those days, to a lot of very battered old men um, who'd come together to work 
on getting common standards. So there was a, a British paratrooper who'd been dropped too far by paratrooper Arnhem and stayed in a chicken coop for six weeks until the British troops caught up with him. There was at least one German soldier who'd lost a leg at Stalingrad. There were two people with tattoos from the camps they'd been interned in, in Eastern Europe. So there were all these people who had every reason to hate each other. Just 30, maximum 30 years since they'd been fighting each other, which is for us now back to well, 1990, the fall of the Berlin Wall. Not that long ago, but even then they were prepared um, to, to sit and speak to each other in a way that made put ancient history behind them. So I, I think that probably stuck in me from a very early age. For a position of, yeah, yeah, I'm sorry yeah. to interrupt you, but I, just, I, just, I find it very interesting that you come from this old background of uh, Europeanness, of solidarity, and of uh, really just coming together, but then you are now faced with this um, fracturing, which Lawrence is encountering with, with Volt. Yeah. Do you see what, what, what you experienced then and what you, the stories that you've heard from then in like the new parties and in this new European wave? Yeah, to an extent. I mean, the, the growth of, I mean, of course, the great joy of the European Parliament is it allows a lot more voices than say, for instance, our British Parliament allows, which is a different voting system. So I remember when a man called Nick Griffin was elected to the European Parliament, who was the representative of the British National Front. Now the British National Front didn't even have the sophistication and the arguments that Marine Le Pen has, which is saying something. You know, it was a straight old fashioned, we don't like foreign people party. Um, with its roots in the 60s and the 70s, opposing Caribbean migration. And yet Nick Griffin got a seat through proportional representation in the European Parliament. And it was great, because for the first time, this man had to actually speak to people at a political level, rather than just shouting from the rooftops. And of course, he discovered that there was no great popular um, uprising for his, his unsophisticated views. Of course, there are extreme right views there are extreme left views in Europe as well. And I, I think it's a great thing that they're incorporated within a, a bigger demos. Um, I don't worry so much as others do that this is the beginning of a sort of Steve Bannon Europe where we just get thrown into great nationalist blocks. Because if nothing else, I suspect that the United Kingdom will be the great example of history of what not to do in terms of your European membership. Um, I think we will be the biggest possible uh, publicity campaign for pro-European parties in the rest of Europe. Do you um, agree with that position, Lawrence? Yeah, I think it's uh, un un unfortunate for a lot of British people, uh, but um, um, I, I, I think I agree with it. I, I think a lot of people never expected that uh, the United Kingdom would actually leave the European Union. Um, so it, it, I think it really was a shockwave and even, uh, yeah, also for the, for the British and for the Conservatives. Uh, I mean, there was no plan. Um, the, the slogans that were used and also the um, uh, numbers that were mentioned during the uh, Take Back Control uh, campaign uh, for the NHS, um, uh, the spending that would immediately be freed up. Um, uh, I mean, I think a lot of people have seen that leaving the European Union is not an, uh, of their best interest. Um, and I think also a lot of people uh, understand also with Trump that um, it's in their best interest to better cooperate and to ensure that within this fast changing world uh, with China, Russia, uh, Turkey and, and, and the US, which is uh, also a little bit more of a um, well, searching country at the moment to, say, to put it like that, I think a lot of people see the, the added value of uh, being in a, a union that is uh, for over 75 years presenting them with peace and, and safety, uh, which have given them a lot of um, uh, wealth uh, in, in the sense that uh, we have created a lot of uh, uh, economic growth. Um, unfortunately, not everyone has profited from that. I think that's something that we need to change, of course. Um, but now it's also time to make the next Next step and to ensure that we encounter other uh, challenges like climate change uh, together, uh, the digital age. Uh, those are also parts that uh, we can do as a Europe as a whole better. And having had Brexit, uh, Brexit 
I think uh, a lot of people indeed now see uh, the the added value of uh, of the European Union even more. Mm. Yet throughout history, I mean, we've seen fracturing, or at least throughout the last 50, 60 or so years. I mean, uh, John just mentioned uh, the British National Front as a party which represented the fracturing of the European Union or uh, of well, Europeanness, I guess. And like, Volt comes from a position of idealism. But I spoke with some people who were part of the Volt campaign in the UK, and they were quite disappointed when everything went down. Um, and I'm just curious, when you see recent news, such as um, well, what's happening in Poland and Hungary, uh, there's plenty of events and related to that, but not only those countries, corruption in uh, Bulgaria, um, police beatings on the border of Europe in Croatia, one of the newest admitted countries. Uh, do you still have that idealism when looking at the big picture? Um, well, I think when we all see uh, uh, the, the, the protests in Bulgaria, or we see the, the veto, uh, we see the, uh, the, the way Hungary is developing. Uh, I mean, uh, we all look at this with, with, with great uh, sad, uh, sadness. I mean, it's not the, the developments we want to be in. Um, but for me, and, and, and I think for a lot of people, um, it's even more a reason to um, work towards the opposite. I mean, um, with Volt, of course, we have a, um, uh, as some, some calls indeed, uh, idealist. Um, but for me, it sounds very logical with what we want to uh, achieve, that we really want to have a European debate. Um, and which I find, uh, you mentioned Bulgaria, and which I find really good uh, of being part of Volt, is that for over 130 uh, days now, Volt is protesting on the streets in Bulgaria uh, because of the corrupt government. And I, I really enjoy that because um, that is also our tax money that is uh, being corrupted by the, the government there. And uh, within the Netherlands, uh, we try to um, make sure that it gets the attention it needs. So uh, Niedeveg, uh, our uh, number two on the list, um, C uh, went to Bureau Buitenland, uh, one of the uh, radio shows uh, at Radio One, um, to get really attention for this. And we send in uh, um, opinion papers uh, to also make sure that within the Netherlands, um, uh, the attention is also uh, there. But uh, I mean, there are a lot of things with, um, which can give you the feeling that we are on the wrong direction. But I think there are also a lot of uh, things that that really shows that we are on the on the right direction. I mean, even even now, 80% in the Netherlands of the people are for a good and a strong uh, Europe cooperation. So I think that is a very very uh, good uh, number. Hmm. I, I, even though there is all these negative strands against the European Union, there is hope and there is progress. Um, yeah. I, but still, people would call it idealistic. Um, and I'm curious. I, I want to bring the conversation again to you, John. Um, when um, Hannah Griffin was contacting you on behalf of the SIB, um, you said a line uh, which you mentioned to me. We have left the European, the European Union, but the European Union hasn't left me. So it strikes me as well that you have this uh, kind of, you already said it during our discussion now that you had this background of uh, well, European togetherness for um, people coming together 20 years after the war with all these different negative shared backgrounds, but then progressing and moving forward to something what which we're experiencing today. I wonder if you have the same kind of uh, hope for Europe into the future of us working together. Yeah, I mean, it's it's not an idealistic hope. It's, it's if nothing else, a recognition that it's the best worst option. I mean, if you look at what's happening in individual countries right now, it's dreadful. But what's the alternative? The alternative is them doing it on their own and beyond the view or the, the reach of, of policymakers who they've, they've formed alliances with. I mean, you see it to a certain extent with Belarus. Belarus is doing what Belarus has been doing for the last 25 years. Um, the difference is we have less um, negotiation power over Belarus because we're not in, in the same relationship with them. So it's I, I mean, I, I was never a, I, maybe I was at moments, but I was never a particularly starry-eyed, um, you know, European federalist in, in that use of the word, because I didn't believe that anybody was particularly keen on that. I don't believe the French people 
or the Portuguese people or the Greek people are any less, to use a word in its positive sense rather than its negative sense, nationalistic than the British people are, for instance, um, unless you give them a reason to be. And of course, for, for Poland and Hungary at the moment, you give them a reason to be because you have a populist leader seeking to bolster their support by looking like the one who's being tough with the rest of Europe. It's classic Donald Trump kind of tactics. Um, but I remember, you know, it wasn't that long ago that we were having exactly the same with Jörg Haider um, of blessed memory in, in Austria, you know, and should the EU suspend Austrian membership because of the FPO? So, you know, I think the fact that we have these discussions at all, that we, we you know, between Scotland and the Netherlands, we are caring about what happens on the streets of Bulgaria and the streets of Hungary shows how far we've come. Yeah, and I think that that is a very good development on the same side as you mentioned. I mean, um, uh, I believe Juncker said to uh, David Cameron when he announced for the Brexit referendum, he said, you cannot turn uh, 40 years of um, um, wrongdoing on Brussels, you cannot change that in three months of uh, campaigning. So I think also... And from a political side, it's, it's uh, one of the things that I believe is still lacking. And I hope that we can also change that a little bit more in the, in the Dutch uh, national parliament uh, if we get elected next year, is to ensure that Europe becomes way more part of the solution and, and of the story that uh, national politicians are telling uh, the people. Um, because at this moment, uh, what you see, for example, on, on, on certain, certain topics like climate, like migration, like the economy, uh, corona even, or, or safety, it's, it's uh, part of the national elections and uh, it is presented as um, um, the Netherlands can solve this uh, by, by themselves, which I believe is not the case. And sometimes we say like, okay, uh, successes uh, that are made in Brussels are claimed on a national level and um, uh, problems that are uh, produced on a national level are uh, uh, put off to Brussels. And I think there is still a role, and I think it's part of for the politicians uh, to do this, and also part of the media to ensure what is what is done where, and and, and to ensure that also people are very well informed of when is happening what. And, and that's that's very important because the what got us to where we were in 2016 in Britain wasn't short term or accidental. You know, people like Nigel Farage who spent 15 years bullying the BBC and others to give. Uh, equality to the views on both sides about Europe when Europe was at best 15, 16 in people's list of priorities in life. They didn't think that it was somehow running their lives and being preoccupying them. But if you're told constantly that it is, then of course it bumps up in, in a way. And, um, you know, you, you talked about the NHS figures and the health figures during the referendum. From our position, when we sat around the table planning the campaign, it was all supposed to be positive and partnership and all these sorts of things. We never expected that people would come at us with straight, flat out lies. It's a bit like Trump again. You're wrong footed when a man just lies publicly, knowingly, and there's nothing you can say against him because he doesn't care. So when they said, you know, one of the famous posters in 2016 was a door opening from Turkey and the door was a British passport, and that door was opening to let 76 million Turks come to Britain. Now, where anybody thought all of Turkey was going to up sticks and walk across Europe and arrive in Birmingham or Edinburgh or wherever, nobody bothered to explain. It didn't matter, but it was just a, it was just a nice, simple story. And of course, on the map, they showed this, this poster. They didn't show the countries that Turkey bordered to the north and the west. They showed the countries that Turkey bordered to the east and the south. So it was all Iraq and you know, scary sounding places for your average British reader. So it's easy to do. And we spent years and years trying to battle EU myths, but we spent so much time getting into the nitty gritty. Well, actually, there isn't a, a regulation that requires that. It's just this, it's just that. And instead of just going on a much higher level, this is what it's for in the first place. Of course, there are issues that people dislike. People dislike the Scottish Parliament, Edinburgh City, and the UK Parliament. That's the nature of democracy. Actually brings us back to the um, overall topic of today's symposium, deconstructing the European Parliament. Um, you just mentioned um, something which is also an issue on the European level, I would say, which is that people are relatively uninformed of what goes on in 
the European Parliament. Um, do, do you think that this is a good system, essentially, is what I want to ask you. Uh, do you think we can keep this going and try to muddle through to fix it? Or does the European Parliament need chronic restructuring? I mean, if I can just put the example uh, for you recently, as mentioned in uh, Dutch TV show, Zondag met Lubach, popular here among students, uh, especially those who study international relations, that uh, journalism is not clear on European level and that lobbyism rules in the European Parliament amongst uh, parliamentarians and amongst commissioners. So that's the European uh, Council and the European commission but it's still part of the same set of institutions so there's lack of oversight and there is no voice for the citizens and i was wondering if either of you um have well a vision as to how that can be solved well i i think um the the episode with uh, sondag with lubach was of course uh, a very uh, a good one it, it, it triggered a lot of people and uh, i mean i believe it even I exploded Twitter uh, to to ask if the uh, European Commissioner uh, was able to join Yinek. Um, uh, during the weeks following uh, this uh, episode, it was about uh, the cigarette um, um, uh, filters um, that were tested by the the producers themselves. Um, and indeed, uh, your, your question is, um, what is the role uh, to ensure that citizens are even more being heard? And I think there are multiple ways to to uh, to improve this. And I mean, one of the key things, of course, that we uh, see right now is that also, what I also mentioned before is that um, Europe should be more part of the debate also on the national level to make it more transparent to people. Okay, but what is happening then on the European level? For example, I believe around uh, 50 or 60 percent of the lawmaking is that being done in Brussels. Um, okay, so what does that mean then on a national context? And what is the role of the Netherlands within those discussions? And how can we ensure that also the Netherlands positions there are being made more transparent so that people also understand? Um, and at the same time, uh, I would say that um, to ensure that we have a true European debate so that we really know what Europe is about and, and, and what's happening and also understand each other within the European atmosphere, I think we should also have more uh, European uh, news uh, out, outlets so that there will be a uh, European MPO, for example. That will be uh, really nice. And I think transnational list, I mean, uh, and that's, uh, of course, partly because I'm uh, uh, part of Volt. Um, but I'm really hoping that there will be a true European democracy in which the European Parliament is debating about European topics um, in, the, in the same way as we do in the Netherlands, that uh, is not only just explaining their point of stance, but that there is really a debate and that you can see who is representing your point of view so that people also really start understanding, okay, there is someone which I have chosen to, uh, to be in the European Parliament is really defending my uh, interest. Um, and I think that is really important that people uh, get that a little bit more uh, also uh, back from the European Parliament, which is currently not the case. And unfortunately, um, last week, um, the European Parliament voted against transnational lists. Uh, so um, we still have to wait for another few years, probably before uh, that can really happen. And I mean, uh, the, the CDA, one of the national parties here, was one of the parties who voted against it. And I think it's really strange that national parties are voting against uh, the option to have a true European democracy. I would actually agree with you there myself, but I, I will kind of want to put this uh, position to John as well. Um, from 2003 to 2009, you were representative of the European uh, Parliament in Edinburgh. And so I was wondering if you've seen uh, similar patterns to what Lawrence uh, just described, and if you agree with his positions from that position of having represented the European Parliament on a national level. Um, is there that lack of oversight? Um, the, I always thought there wasn't, there isn't a formal lack of oversight. I think the institution of the Parliament works fine. The problem is, if people don't think it works fine, then there is a democratic deficit. So there may not be an actual mechanical democratic deficit, but if people don't know what it does, then there is a democratic deficit. And that, yes, that is partly guilty, uh, the guilt of the national governments 
and parliaments who will blame Europe for having, oh, well, we have to do this because Brussels says so, but we fought hard and whatever else. And when things go their way, they, they advertise. But actually, most countries are usually in the majority, um, at least in the council. Most big parties are usually in the majority in the parliament. Um, I think it's, it's difficult. Personally, um, and this probably didn't make me terribly popular with some of my bosses in the European Parliament, I think the Parliament has to focus first on what it actually can do. I think one of the biggest problems we had in the Parliament in trying to sell it was we were trying to pretend we were everything. And if you pretend that you are a formal national Parliament, then people get cross. And it wasn't just the Brits. It was the Dutch, it was the Swedes, it was the Danes, it was increasingly some of the countries from Eastern Europe who said, well, this is not what you are. So if you have a view on absolutely everything, including those things you have no legislative competence over, then you start to look a bit silly. So I don't belittle the statements they made in foreign policy. And obviously now the foreign policy agenda has, has changed since the days I was in Brussels as much more collectivism there. But if you spend hours and hours debating issues on things that you have no legislative control over, including some of the overseas budget, then you start to look a little bit like your, your grandson. And there was a bit of that. Parliament itself is not a particular, I mean, I, I have sympathy with the points about the media, but it's not an easy organization to cover. Committees are massive and they're extremely dull unless you know the piece of legislation that you're following. It isn't good television in a good journalistic sense. And the plenary, um, at least if you're brought up on the sort of British Yabu Westminster style, is equally dull because everybody gets an allotted set sense of time and it's all a bit static because, of course, you're translating into 23 other languages at the same time. Um, so there are all sorts of technical things that I think could be could be changed, but that's only if you're trying to make it look like a proper parliament. And I, I, I don't mean a proper in a real sense. I just mean in a, the sense that most everyday voters consider their national parliament to be. Um, one tiny issue, I'd get out of Strasbourg tomorrow. I, th I think if, if you're trying to be taken seriously, and you're trying to be show yourself as having budget scrutiny and taken how taxpayers' money is well spent, However symbolic and tiny the amount of money that's spent on Strasbourg is, it's, a, it's an own goal every time. And I entirely get the, um, the symbolic importance. I've walked over that bridge many, many times when I stayed in Strasbourg, the, where, the, where the, the original border of Western Europe was down the river between France and Germany. Um, but you have to move on from this the traveling circus of putting everybody's office in a box and moving it down the motorway. And of course, if you're in Cyprus, or if you're on the, uh, in Frankfurt on the Oder in Poland, or somewhere else, there are lots of other lines in Europe that mean much more to you in terms of division than the one that used to be in France and Germany these days. So th there's things the parliament could do, I think almost to be more humble in a certain strange way. Parliaments succeed best when they scrutinize well. The Westminster parliament, the Scottish parliament score goals when they hold their government or their executive to account on serious individual issues. And that's where I think the focus should be rather than, if you like, a sense of, I don't know. And I, I hope it's not me being British yet because I hope my credentials in Europe are, uh, are safe enough. But there is a, there's a grandiose element to the European Parliament that I think doesn't do it a lot of good. And, and the European elections you mentioned were a great example. We would sit in a room of 45 people and the guy from Malta would say, I'm doing this in Valletta this week. And the director would go, that's a great idea. Let's all do that. Now, whatever works in Valletta does not work in Marseille. Whatever works in Marseille does not work in Krakow. And it certainly doesn't work in Glasgow. So, you know, there has to be a certain... If you're going to be honest about subsidiarity, then you have to actually exercise it properly as well both in policy terms, but also in practice terms. And while I'm being a, a, a nasty Brit and scrapping the Strasbourg Parliament, I'd get rid of the Economic and Social Committee and the Committee of the Regions as well, because people don't take them seriously. And if you're not taken seriously, then you make it easier for your opponents to score goals against you. 
Yeah, of course, sure. traveling from Brussels to Strasbourg is a uh, perfect example of uh, um, the way people have a feeling that their uh, tax money is being misused, and uh, even though it's a small percentage, of course, of the total budget, but it's the symbolic, and it's it's really crazy. And also a few weeks ago, and uh, I think a lot of people also got really annoyed by it, was that um, due to Corona, and there are no uh, uh, sessions right now, a lot of people, uh, European Parliament members are uh, working from home. Um, so they are not, um, uh, uh, they do not get assigned their daily allowance, uh, which is uh, quite an amount. Uh, and of course, the money they make is already uh, quite a, a good amount. Um, so there were a lot of people in the Netherlands, and to be honest, I was as well, really annoyed that they were not willing to uh, uh, take, a firm, uh, how do you say it, uh, put this uh, away from them. So uh, um, it was a bit strange, but it's one of the things. Um, but uh, one other thing that I think is uh, going well and what you see also, uh, and I think that is a big shift that is going to happen in, in the coming few years as well, is that, uh, and I think also this evening is an example of this, is that a lot of young people um, are working together on a digital way throughout Europe. So, of course, you have the Erasmus program uh, in which they are uh, getting more uh, acquainted to each other. Um, but also the digital way of working is ensuring that you are able to uh, maintain your friendships um, over uh, borders uh, even more easy. Uh, and I think that is also a, an easy way to ensure of what is happening in the European Union. And I think this will also help uh, in better understanding uh, where uh, we are heading to. I don't disagree with you there, but I kind of want to bring it back to a point that John raised earlier, that uh, Europe, is, in your words, is perhaps too grandiose in its uh, presentation and its behavior. Um, your critics seem to be uh, aimed at the way that European Parliament conceives of itself, if I'm correct, John. Elements of it's elements of presentation. Um, you know, when the European Constitution was being proposed, um, and of course, the most important thing about the European Constitution was it wasn't a constitution. It was it was a further treaty amending some of the ways of working of the European Union. The biggest mistake, and I put this entirely at the feet of Giscard d'Estaing, was to say we're going to we're going to formalize the flag, we're going to formalize the anthem, we're going to do it like this. If you like that kind of thing, that's fine. But I don't sing my British national anthem. I don't salute my British flag. I don't salute the Scottish flag, except at a rugby match. So, you know, I didn't, I just, I thought that the, the, the focus on those things was an unnecessary um, poking of a stick through the bars of Eurosceptics. You know, it was absolute food and drink to them when it really actually didn't change much. I've, I've spoken, I spoke at a conference of the peripheral and maritime regions of Europe, the CPMR, last year in, in Donegal in the west of Ireland. And at the beginning, they played the Ode to Joy and everybody had to stand up. Now, the only people who looked really, really uncomfortable were the hosts, who were as European as anybody. The Irish people there were the hosts. But they just don't do that kind of thing. And I think there's that sort of sense of it, it's an unnecessary symbol of nationalism, which is just not necessary. You know, they don't do it in the UN. They don't do it in, well, the WTO, our great British WTO that we're obsessed about right now. They don't do it in NATO. And I don't think it makes it a better democracy by making people, and I don't think it makes people more pro-European by saying this is your flag and this is your hand. Because if you look at golf, uh, sorry to go on a tangent here, but the British people become incredibly European once every two years when we play America at golf. And everybody walks around the streets of London with European flags and European hats on because they have something that they're invested in. But telling them they have to do it, I think is, is the dangerous side. And I just find that sometimes the institutions, understandably, because they have to balance well, it was 28, now 27 different national sensibilities. But sometimes I find that the lack of modesty almost sometimes a little bit grating. And that may be a, that may be a British thing, but I don't think it's exclusively British. 
So maybe a European football or rugby team then. Um, but more seriously, um, you were essentially make a claim regarding that Europe, Europe tries to present itself too much as a nation um, and that it can't decide whether it's a national parliament or an institution which governments all of Europe. Uh, Laurens is representing Volt Europa, the European Federalist Party, which aims to make Europe on that national level European wide. And so like, I can't help but think that you must disagree somewhat there, Lorenz, or am I interpreting wrongly? Uh, well, no, um, uh, I, I disagree in, 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 in a certain respect, but um, uh, I will get to that. Uh, first, I wanted to get back a little bit to the uh, referendum of uh, 2005, because within that, I completely agree, but we sometimes say that the European Union has a, a marketing issue instead of uh, being uh, all about the grandeur, because um, I have the feeling, and, and a lot of people with me, I guess, is that the European Union is not able to tell its story. It's not able to show what it's really doing for uh, the, the Europeans. Um, and you also see it in the discussion eh, with uh, the, uh, the European uh, constitution. Is, it's, it's about the flag then. Or um, in the Netherlands in 2005, it, it really came... There's a, I, I would recommend it to you all. There's a really nice uh, short documentary about this. It only takes 20 minutes. Uh, you see uh, Frans Timmermans, uh, young Frans Timmermans, uh, being uh, part of the um, uh, team that had helped writing uh, the, the European Constitution. And you see that uh, the Dutch government gets completely surprised by uh, the audience because they didn't have any uh, marketing or advertisement or they didn't uh, take took the people along in the story of, of this uh, uh, development. So for a lot of people, it came as a surprise and it was really easy for the against party to just go against it because there was no story why we should have this. There was no story of what the aim of it was. There was no story of where we were heading with Europe. There was no story of what would be next. Um, and if you don't have a vision of where you want to go, and if you don't uh, tell people, okay, we are currently here, but our vision for the next few years is that we, and for us, for Volt, that is in, indeed head towards uh, 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 federation, um, then it's also that people have the feeling, okay, where does it stop? And I mean, we want to head to a uh, federation, and I mean, even federation, in itself already has a lot of different meanings. Um, so, so that's something to explain as well. Um, but we want to uh, head to this federation because we believe that is the best means to an end. Uh, and the end is to uh, uh, solve uh, the big challenges as climate change, to have uh, a common foreign policy, to ensure that within this fast changing world that we can uh, stick to our freedoms and our democracy and uh, et cetera, and that we have um, uh, migration that we can uh, solve together. Um, so that is the reason that we want to move towards this, uh, this federation in the, in the future. And the first part of getting there, uh, because it takes years and years, is uh, to, to stop, for example, with the veto. Yeah, and, and, and that can be done. I mean, I, th I think Europe is at its best when it has a purpose. And its initial purpose was post-war reconciliation, you know, making war materially impossible. That's about as noble a purpose as you'll ever find. Um, and then there was common standards. There was the single market, the internal market. Um, to a certain extent, climate change, I think, should be the absolute overriding um, focus of Europe because it's, it is a truly global purpose which Europe can have a, a serious voice in. So, and, and I think that's, that's where the strength can be, picking your themes that you're strong on rather than claiming to have a view on everything. And, and you know, CFP, as it used to be called, you know, the Common Foreign Security Policy, as was, is a, is a classic example. There are great things that can be done. And I used to, my first, my very first job in Brussels was a stagiaire in the very new humanitarian office that had been set up post Yugoslavia, post Rwanda, um, to deal with a huge amount of money that Europe had brought together to spend in these countries that they didn't know how. Um, you know, it, you, Europe collectively is still the single biggest humanitarian donor in the world. Brilliant story, brilliant piece of activity. 
So focus on that and don't focus on the bits of foreign policy that for the time being you cannot act on. So for instance, I spent months in the European referendum and before denying questions to me in public and on television that we were all gonna be part of a European army and that British troops would have to serve in a European army and our boats would be taken away by the French and all of this kind of stuff, which is silly, but it comes if people don't express clearly what they mean by defense cooperation. And if they, they allow themselves to get taken down that line. And um, you know, nobody ever bothered to explain what would happen to the neutral countries like Finland, like Austria, like Ireland. You know, they're not going to be compelled to have an army any more than we are. Nobody would explain what France and the United Kingdom would do about their veto on the Security Council. You know, th there were practical things that made all these threats look ridiculous, but nobody bothered to counter them. So I do think it, yeah, absolutely focus on the, on the you know, data. Look at artificial intelligence. Look at climate change. Look at all the things that the world is now facing, global pandemics where you can have an active role in the research and the dissemination of all of that, rather than having a view on absolutely everything. I mean, we, we argue enough between Edinburgh and London about who has the power over which areas. You don't need to create another level of argument about everything. And if you, on another set, because a few weeks ago I was in a podcast and then, um, uh, we had a, the author of a book uh, about Stefan Zweig. And uh, Stefan Zweig was an uh, uh, Austrian author in the 20s and 30s uh, uh, in Europe. And he, he was also called Mr. Europe, uh, but he was more also on a cultural level. So what he said, he said, okay, uh, Europe should become a cultural union uh, before it becomes a political union. And I find that very interesting because um, we discuss a lot of politics right now. Um, but uh, like uh, um, Jacques Delors said, uh, the internal market you cannot uh, fall in love with. Um, but Europe itself has so much culture uh, that we share and that we have together, but which is very um, uh, under, uh, there's no spotlight on that. On that. Um, and most of the time we think of the European Union of Europe, uh, it's more about the politics that we have. And I mean, for a lot of people, politics is uh, not the first thing that they enjoy uh, when they start the day. But the music uh, from uh, Avicii of, uh, of Mozart or uh, uh, the coffee, the Italian coffee, is, is something that they do enjoy. So that is also something uh, I think we, we need to focus a, a bit more on. Um, and um, one of the fun things that also someone mentioned to me is that if you look at the Olympic Games, then uh, most of the time in the rankings, you see the United States uh, as being the first, uh, having won the most uh, gold medals. Then you see China. Uh, and then maybe on the third or fourth row, uh, there is uh, Britain or Germany, uh, if, we're, if we're lucky. But if you would count all the European countries together, then there would be the European Union by far being the number one, uh, having the most gold and silver medals. So um, it's also sometimes looking at a different way to the European Union. But can this uh, European culture help us solve climate change or COVID? Well, um, it, it can keep people talking. That's the point. It, it, it can demystify nationalities and things. So you don't fall back into easy, lazy stereotypes about the, the lazy Mediterraneans or the scheming French or the obstructive British or the drunk Irish or the drunk Scots, in fact. Um, you know, there's all these... If you're cooperating on research levels in, in Erasmus, if you're cooperating on climate issues, then it's it's just the, the, the traditional national politics don't come into it. I do think, but again, I mean, the Olympics is a classic example. That comes up every time the Olympics happen and every time the British right-wing press runs a story about how Europe wants to seize our athletes and our cyclists and everything. And it's all because the Dutch feel bad because they don't have as many cyclists as we do. And all this <laughs> kind of nonsense. It's an easy goal. It's an easy goal. There's no need for us to go there. Um, you know, Mac, the guy I worked for, Max, Max believed in 1951, 52, that Europe would end up as a federation, but his Europe was six countries at that point. Max lived long enough 
to hear Latvian and Lithuanian spoken in the corridors of the European Commission, I think he thought he never thought he would see. So he'd never planned on that basis of Europe being to that scale. And, you know, I, I lived for a short while in Luxembourg. You know, Luxembourg is the great joke to others of it's, well, of course it's pro-European, it's got no choice. Well, no, it doesn't. But what's the national motto of Luxembourg? The national motto of Luxembourg in Luxembourgish is we want to remain what we are. You know, and that, that is directed towards Germany, it's directed towards France, and it's directed towards Belgium. So, you know, everybody, everybody who had their breaking point, their red lines when it comes to what makes them nationalistic or what makes them internationalistic. And I think it's just, it just requires a sensitivity on that front to find the things. And that's why, you know, the European political community in the 50s didn't work. The European defense community didn't work, but the economic community did because people were prepared to cooperate on that basis. That's quite a strong statement. Um, even though it's dependent on Europe, it still wants to maintain its own identity and its own culture. Um, we have 15 minutes left before we go into audience questions. So I think I'd just um, end it here by uh, putting one final question to you. Um, during your talk, you have mentioned uh, the European response to pandemics, or response to climate, or perhaps even European army, which uh, you seem to be against, John. But uh, regardless, all of these factors, uh, Europe really has to come together for. The European Parliament has to be united, European institutions have to be united, they have to be united on a national level to try and uh, find a common response. The refugee crisis is polarizing as ever, and I think it might be the most polarizing thing, even more so than COVID and climate, et cetera, et cetera. However, the current crisis we're facing is that posed by COVID-19. Um, so I want to ask the two of you, perhaps Lawrence first, uh, whether you can see uh, Europe coming together on that set, on that scale uh, to perhaps in the near future counter COVID-19 and in the distant future, find a common solution to the refugee crisis and matters such as climate change. Yeah, well, first uh, look at, at, at uh, the COVID uh, crisis. I mean, what you saw when uh, COVID ended in Europe, you saw a national response by all countries. Uh, borders closed, um, uh, people weren't able to travel anymore, medicine was, was stuck at the borders. Um, there was a, a fight uh, on the, the, uh, the mask market. Um, uh, and you, see, you saw that all countries were in it for themselves. Um, and only after a while, you saw that uh, Europe was opening up again with the European Commission taking the lead in the Recovery and Resilience Fund, uh, so the Corona Herstel Funds, um, and at the same time repatriating uh, different Europeans from all over the world. Um, and you saw slowly that European countries were starting to cooperate. I mean, we had Dutch people that were uh, on the intensive care at, uh, uh, in Germany. Um, Germany was doing a lot of efforts to, to help uh, uh, with Italy as well. Um, and slowly you saw uh, Europe uh, working together a bit more. But I think it was uh, too little uh, and it could have been done better. But healthcare is at this moment a national uh, capability. Um, so um, uh, the European Commission and the European Parliament doesn't have a say about this. Um, so a few weeks ago, the European Commission presented a, a plan uh, for a ne uh, future uh, pandemics that uh, there will be pandemic books uh, to ensure that as a Europe, we would be better uh, 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 willing to, to work together on this. Um, but Mark Rutte, our Dutch Prime Minister, um, immediately said that healthcare is a national interest, uh, a national capability. So for me, that is a bit disappointing. And um, if you say, okay, uh, Europe should be uh, coming more together, then this is one of the things that I think uh, should be changed to ensure that also in the future, that we are able to work together on the, on the, on the health crisis. Um, but what you see here is, and I, I mean, we saw it also from the Netherlands uh, with the Recovery and Resilience Fund, um, the way the Dutch entered the negotiations, yeah, our Ministry of Finance, uh, Minister of Finance said to the Italians, 
uh, when uh, the hospitals are being uh, were so full that um, uh, some people weren't able to to be uh, there anymore. Uh, he asked why the Italians didn't have their budget in order. Um, and I mean, um, that is not in the best interest of Europeans. That is in the best interest of national parties to behave like that. And um, I think there is quite a, a, a uh, a long way to go to ensure that we are moving forward together. Uh, and for this, uh, you know, what I said before, we believe that the European Union um, uh, needs to be reformed also in a way that it's becoming um, better equipped to uh, put the European interest uh, first instead of the national interest. Because in the end, the European Parliament is representing its citizens and the European Council is uh, representing nation states. So, um, I, my hope is that uh, we are moving, moving forward to a European democracy to ensure that we can uh, immediately and fast uh, act when certain things happen. I mean, um, so the refugee crisis you also mentioned is a big disgrace. I believe uh, it's, it's for me, it's under, I cannot understand that in, in, in the European Union where we are so wealthy where things are uh, being arranged for us in all uh, types of way that we have on the borders, uh, camps uh, in tents where we have people for over multiple years um, and, and they are even on uh, uh, listed grounds. Um, that, that is something I really cannot understand. That, um, and, and we do that because it has a shocking effect for future uh, refugees. So I believe it's a disgrace and I think uh, uh, yeah, Europe should act really together to, to change this. And the way Europe works at this point in, uh, in time is not able to do that, so. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I, I agree with a lot of that. I think, I think the, vi the pandemic, I think, will change policy in the future. I think, I think it's probably come too early for people to understand how it might have been done differently and a lot of lessons will be learned. But clearly, we're moving into a different understanding of of what global health is all about now. We previously it all been we're doing great. We're you know getting rid of smallpox and all this kind of stuff, and we're chucking a bit of money at malaria. I think our our view of this globally and and, and continentally will be entirely different now. But the, the trick for Europe was and is to focus on the things. Lawrence is right that it, there are, there's a lot of vetoes in this area. So focus on the things that you do have control over, like the research budget. You know, they should have, in the same way that previous framework programs have channeled large amounts of money towards climate change, there should have been a very specific program focusing on COVID research um, and future pandemic research uh, in a way that would sort of circumvent the national, sadly, the sort of showboating that some national governments feel it necessary to do. We've bought more copies of the vaccine than anybody else has. We've done this, we've done that. And in the humanitarian side, you know, Europe, I think, has been quite good, but probably not loud enough in terms of saying, if this is to be a vaccine, it must be a global vaccine, and our commitment to international aid must reflect that. Um, you know, there, there are areas like that. In the same way, we, we have endless discussions in the Parliament about the transport of animals around Europe and, you know, this sort of thing. F free movement of vaccines ought to be, <laughs> you know, there's free movement of disease, so there has to be free movement of vaccines. There are things you could talk about. And that's where I, I totally agree on refugees. It, it, is, it is shaming for everybody, institutionally and nationally, what's happened. If you consider that basically the raison d'etre of, of at least part of the community in the very beginning was the sight of millions of people moving around Europe to rebuild their lives after 1945, that nobody could find within that narrative something to say about two and a half million displaced people in Syria and elsewhere um, in, in this world. And you know, we are lucky that the Berlin Wall fell with not completely, but relative bloodlessness. But it wouldn't have been too difficult for something that happened in Yugoslavia to be replicated in other countries of Eastern Europe. And then we wouldn't perhaps have been so glib about the idea about mass movement of refugees across the continent of Europe. Um, you know, we forget what happened within the former Yugoslavia, but, you know, I mean, my country, one of, one of the eternal shames I feel about the Brexit debate is we spent four years insisting that all the other member states talk about us 
when they should be talking about the people who are clamoring to cross the, the Mediterranean in a dinghy or trying to get over a fence to get into Serbia, whatever it might be. Um, and that would have been the best example of an area in which this is what international cooperation can do. This is what intergovernmentalism can do, is we can come up with a structure and a model that deals with this. Because, you know, ultimately, humanitarian aid, among other things, is partly designed selfishly to stop people moving from their homes. So, you know, you need to be able to respond to that kind of thing rather than simply go, well, it's not our fault, it's their fault. You know, we do it in Britain, we say, well, it's not our fault, it's France's fault. And France says, it's not our fault, it's Italy's fault. And Italy says, it's not our fault, it's Libya's fault or whatever. You know, it's surely to goodness between us with the, with the resources we have in terms of security, in terms of public health, in terms of intelligence, in terms of anything, we could have come up with a more sophisticated response to the refugee crisis than we have. Because God knows there'll be another one at some point or another. And I think also what the options are within Europe is, I mean, what I really like is the, um, the Green Deal. It's like a Marshall Plan. It's really moving forward with hydrogen valleys and um, um, really also looking towards the future. And also digitization is one of the key um, uh, indicators that the European Commission wants to work on. Uh, I mean, uh, you just mentioned the artificial intelligence. Uh, in the 90s, the European continent missed a little bit the, the internet hype, uh, and meaning that currently from the biggest 15 uh, uh, companies, tech companies in the world, they're non-European. Um, so also, I think it's really good, and I think, uh, I hope it also uh, uh, will be seen, is that Europe is now really moving forward on this um, uh, green uh, wave and also the digital wave to ensure that um, we as a Europe really truly become a, a front runner in this, uh, in this area. And it can also be a front runner in the world for this and also help the world in, in, in becoming more sustainable uh, and in encountering climate change. I certainly hope so. I think the same goes for the rest of us here in this uh, call, although I can't speak for others. Uh, I would like to just call for a short round of applause again for our speakers. Uh, thank you very much for that discussion. It was quite inspiring. I'm going to have to watch that back again uh, once we're done here. Um, now I think we should move into a bit more uh, Q&A format. So what I'll do is I'll take uh, questions from the audience. Um, they can post them to either of you. Uh, they'll be regarding things you've said in this uh, discussion or during uh, previous points uh, of yours in when you were working in the European Parliament, uh, John, or in your campaign, Laurens. Um, since we have no questions as of yet, I do want to remind you, please send them in via the YouTube chat or just raise your hand via the, the button in the participant screen uh, on the right. Um, I do have one coming in from Florentina von Sante, but before I ask that, I still want to uh, end with um, one final question for each of you. Um, John Edward, uh, you said during our small discussion before we began uh, the live stream that at some point you saw Scotland re-entering the Union and that uh, the person you worked for, possibly, possibly, um, but if it did, you'd be happy for it, if I'm correct. Yeah, there, there's a lot yes. of that question. Um, there is a lot, but it's not for you. Yeah. I yeah. want to pose that question to Laurence Dawson, and I want to pose a different question to you, John. Okay. Um, Laurence is representative here of Fold Europa, which is the party of European federalism. It, let's say it's 2030, 2040, 2050. Uh, Federal Europe happens. Uh, Scotland is a part of it. Um, are, would you be in favor of that vision? Do you see this being a potential future of where decisions are made on a federal level? John? Uh, I, I think, <laughs> he was running away. <laughs> no, no, no. I, I, I genuinely think it's, it's unlikely you're going to move to more federation than you're at at the moment. Genuinely. Uh, um, and I only say that from the pragmatism of knowing the people I know from across the, the member states. I, I think the further you move away from the original six and the binding commitment they had, 
Um, I think the harder it is to fall upon a, a common set of standards, they're going to agree. And if you look at, you know, Mr. Macron may be many things, but he's not, I think, a federalist uh, any more than Mr. Sarkozy was. Um, we don't know who the next Chancellor of Germany will be, but you know, there's, there isn't much unanimity about moving more powers to, to a European level. And indeed, I think Europe could be most effective if it simply used the ones it has more effectively to you know, in its scrutiny of the member states. So not that I think it wouldn't be a bad idea in some ways, and I think there probably is, and I wouldn't say it in Britain, more, more federation in Europe than people are prepared to admit in some cases. Um, I think the likelihood of there being more formal federation, I think, barring some, some global earthquake, and this year's one isn't big enough yet to push people towards it, I, I, I don't see it. I don't see it happening. I, I you know, t take foreign policy and defence. I mean, you know, to, to be a, a genuine federation, you have to have some tax raising powers. You have to have some civil powers in terms of policing, in terms of defence and these sorts of things. Britain would never have agreed to those sorts of things. I'm not sure France would ever agree to things like that either. So I just, you know, it's, it's not a lack of will. I just think I don't see it happening. Maybe someday due to some climate disaster. Yeah. Now, Lawrence, I don't want to pose you the same question, but I want to ask you rather about uh, Scotland joining the European Union. Something perhaps more likely than uh, fully federal Europe. Do you see it happening in the next 10, 20 years? Um, well, I, I, I think uh, it will happen, um, but I'm not sure if it will be then Scotland only or that the whole UK will join uh, uh, in, in again. Uh, I mean, if you look at the voting lines of the Brexit referendum, uh, I think you see that there's a difference between um, uh, a lot of young people who didn't went voting. Um, and, and I believe that, well, at a certain moment, there will be another referendum. Um, and I think they will uh, rejoin the European Union then, yeah. To hear. And honestly, I, I mean, I, I hope that uh, the uh, the heart of the Brexit will not be as bad as the predictions are right now. I mean, especially uh, for Britain, but also for the Netherlands. I mean, the impact will be quite huge. Um, and so let, let's see how that will happen. But uh, I mean, in the long run, I hope uh, at least that the cooperation between the UK and the EU will be very well uh, stabilized. I mean, it's very important because... UK is a very uh, big uh, and important partner of the European Union and um, seeing them leave in this way and, and, and the political games that are being played over the, the heads of uh, people, um, both on the European Union side as well on the UK side, I think it's not in the interest of anyone. Um, so um, I, I believe that uh, we need more and stronger uh, cooperation um, uh, on the short run and also in the long run in the, in the world that is uh, changing as fast as it's doing today and probably will be in the in the future as well. And also where uh, democracy is not uh, being the standards anymore uh, within all uh, countries. I mean, um, looking at Brazil, looking at uh, China, uh, looking at uh, Turkey, what's happening, uh, even at the United States with uh, with Trump. I mean, uh, we need uh, to to make sure that we are cooperating very strongly with democracies around the world to protect the way we deem uh, is the best way of living. Thank you for that answer. It was uh, quite quite co co cohesive. Um, I now have a question from the audience. Uh, Florentina, would you like to ask your question yourself? Yeah, sure. Um, first off, thank thank you to the both of you for all your insight. It was definitely very interesting to hear. Um, my question, as a member of the All Female Disputes of SIP Groningen, um, I was wondering right now um, there is quite large differences between uh, European countries in the amount of women in high functions within companies, uh, and seeing as that many of those companies um, are present in multiple different countries. Do you think that the European, European Union here has a role? Uh, and if so, what would that role be? 
Yeah, so if you if you ask me, I, I definitely believe the European Union has a role, uh, national parties, uh, the national uh, government as well. Um, I mean, it's um, strange that at this point in time, still women are uh, very much unrepresented in uh, various public figures. Uh, that's also why we have with Vault, we have a, a parity on the list. We say uh, all the lists need to have 50% uh, men, 50% women to ensure that representation is uh, improving, but we also expect this from the government. We expect this from uh, publicly listed companies uh, as well. And I think also on the European level and the European uh, Union um, should strive towards a better representation for both uh, women uh, and, and men as well. So um, I, I, I believe they have a, 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 an example uh, role in this, um, the same as the Dutch uh, government would have. Yeah, I think it's, I think it's one of these ones that's tricky to legislate on on a transnational basis, unless you have, tra I mean, if you have transnational parties, sorry, transnational companies who have shareholders in different countries, and those countries themselves have standards, then, you know, each, the companies should be held to that in each one. I think it would be difficult for the union to set anything beyond aspirational targets because I'm not I just don't see the member states being prepared to surrender the, the the power over that although obviously in social policy they have a lot of stuff anyway I think it's I mean it's what this is one of these areas where um, you know we, in Britain we've employed a combination of legislation and example and they've probably worked equally well you know so for instance until December of this year the only part of the United Kingdom that wasn't run by a woman was Wales. Um, you know, so we have plenty of examples politically. We probably have quite a lot of examples in a business sense. Um, we have things like a, which I think is a good idea across the continent, certainly within a single market. Um, you, you have gender pay reports. So companies are required here to explain in an annual report if there is a gender pay gap, why there is a gender pay gap, what it is and what they're intending to do about it. So I think there are ways you can, you can do it. Um, obviously, if it's a public organization, and again, this is where it gets into national rather than international, then I think that's an absolute expectation that there should be, there should be um, moves towards it. But again, here in Britain, if I look at political lists, we've had struggles where people have tried to have for instance, all female political lists, and they've been struck down. Um, or you have zipping of lists, and you have one of each, and it, and it kind of works. But it's, I think it's one of these areas where you could probably do a lot more through example. But I certainly think in terms of cross-border um, companies and cross-border organizations, I think what there's, there's a role there for Europe to coordinate what, you know, the, the if there's scrutiny of gender pay gaps in one country, there should be the equivalent scrutiny in the other end, for instance, because those are the kind of things that themselves will suppress um, promotion and, and appointment to higher office as well. But it's, it's really uh, uh, strange that um, I believe this year, it was the 10th of November, so it's already one month ago, um, that on that day, all women in Europe could stop working because uh, from that point onwards, they were not getting paid anymore. I mean, that, that's something that could not happen anymore. Uh, and some other things that can also work is that, for example, a more free daycare, um, because you still see um, at this point in time that uh, most of the childcare is being done by the women. Um, that's something that is also culturally biased, I believe. But um, uh, for example, free daycare uh, could also help in ensuring that uh, um, uh, women are more able to work. Uh, and, and also within that respect, you get better representation. Mm. And, and it's a great example where you have national and international comparison. So um, in Britain, the move towards people taking paternity care seriously, for instance, was entirely because of Europe, entirely because of legislation at the European level. And, and that has changed beyond all recognition. My children, sadly, are too old now for me to benefit from that. But when they were around at first, you know, it, it is a different regime than we're in now. Um, and, and there are things like that that are different. Um, 
as I say, I, I, the danger is, um, and you, you see this in some other arguments about, about rights, and you know, particularly in some of the countries of Eastern Europe, where you start to activate people who start saying, it's not your business to say, you know, the family should be the unit that decides these things and all sorts. You can get into ludicrous arguments about religion and faith and family and all sorts of things, which you don't need to get into if you're doing it in a, in a different way. But I mean, it's, you know, if, if I speak to my parents, it, it is, Britain is unrecognisable in terms of equal opportunities and what it was even in the 70s. Um, and some of that is due to its membership of the European community slash union. It will be interesting to see where we go in the coming years when we don't have that sense of comparison breathing down our neck all the time. Hopefully it'll be um, a continuation of previous progress, though. Uh, Florentina, I hope your answer question was answered. It was thoroughly discussed, and I think I got an answer from that. Uh, but I do have more questions from the audience, so if you don't mind, we'll move on. Um, all right. In that case, I have a question from uh, Paul, specifically for John. So, oh, here it is. Having mentioned being confronted by outright lies and having experience with someone from the press propagating nonsense, who is currently prime minister, how does the pro-Europe camp get its message across properly when it's apparently so much more profitable to spread this nonsense? His words, not mine. But uh, <laughs> what's your take on this? I, I can't possibly imagine who he's talking about in that question. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, people forget, I mean, the, the, the Euro myths that became so popular in Britain the you know fishermen have to wear hair nets, condoms all have to be the same size. You Banana. can't have crisps that taste like this or whatever. A large part of that was invented by Boris Johnson when he was the political correspondent of the Daily Telegraph, based in Brussels. At the same time, I was there. It was a joke for him. It was a laugh. It was a bit of a a prank almost, but it hit a chord. And unfortunately we didn't realize early enough and the EU didn't realize early enough that it was hitting a chord, a populist chord. Um, but it's a problem. And, and, you know, and as I, go, I mentioned at the beginning, it's a problem if you've got the leader of the free world telling flat out lies and everybody just sitting there going, you know, and saying nothing, then it encourages people to say these things. And yeah, as I say, we were naive in the Remain campaign in 2016. We genuinely didn't believe people would come up with arguments like the National Health Service will cease to exist if we don't, don't leave Europe. Um, you know, the Turkish one, which I've used. After the shooting, I, I can't remember the name of the nightclub. There was a nightclub in Orlando, Florida, where um, some radicalized person walked in and machine gunned something like 50 people. And the next day, the Leave campaign had a poster saying that if you want to stop these kind of outrages, you have to leave the European Union. But as if somehow there was a free market or, you know, free circulation and single market in terrorism and outrage, you know, ludicrous, a ludicrous kind of stuff. And I think we were caught by surprise by that. Um, I think Boris Johnson probably even now is having second thoughts about the side he picked um, in the Europe. I mean, famously, he had two articles written in 2016, his Leave article and his Remain article, and he chose to go for Leave because he thought that would progress his own political prospects. Because he, you know, I, I, I don't generally disparage people who look for public service and to, to serve, but you know, he's clearly a man who's in it because he always wanted to be the boss. You know, he doesn't have a philosophy behind what he does at all. So what he did was, and what David Cameron did, was play to those people who genuinely, and I don't doubt them, genuinely believe that the European project has eroded classical British sovereignty as established by Magna Carta and going on for thousands of years. The fact that Magna Carta wasn't in Scotland or Wales or Northern Ireland is, is irrelevant to them. It's an English nationalism in that respect, but it's difficult. I think, to, irrespective of what Scotland does, and as I say, there's a lot of ifs and buts there, I think the most chance that a pro-European debate has in the United Kingdom is is the simple, slow attrition of people looking at things like COVID, looking at things like the refugee crisis, looking at things like data, looking at things like climate change and going, we are not as effective as we could be unless we're part of this. 
And that will take a different government and a different generation probably to do that. Um, it may take another great global crisis to do it. Um, but my only regret, well, I have many regrets about 2016. My, one of my regrets is that the referendum wasn't the week after the American election. It would have been a lot easier to, to stress the importance of, inter, of cooperation and intergovernmentalism in Europe if we'd had you-know-who already in the White House. I think I would agree with you there uh, very much so. I think that also answered Paul's question. Um, so I'll move on to a different question from the audience, if that's all right by you. Um, Sim had a question for uh, Lawrence specifically. Um, so let him ask it himself. Yes. Um, I believe I heard you talk about either the EU uh, or the European Commission um, rejecting a proposal for transnational lists during um, uh, uh, during elections. Could you elaborate something uh, a bit more on that? Yeah, so um, uh, thanks for your question, Asim. Um, so indeed, um, uh, there have been uh, over the past uh, decennia uh, multiple discussions if it should be possible to uh, have transnational lists during European elections. So that it would be possible for you uh, to vote on uh, someone from France that is really well representing you. That's exactly saying what, uh, what you uh, envision or for a party, for a European party that is um, uh, uh, saying the program you uh, you would like to vote for. So uh, last week, um, the European Parliament, um, uh, no, I, I have to uh, say something before this. Um, Ursula von der Leyen became a, a commission uh, president um, also because, um, maybe uh, John, you know this as well, um, uh, Macron said uh, that uh, he would support transnational uh, lists. Um, uh, so that was very important that the Commission would uh, come forward with a proposal for this. And the European uh, Parliament uh, had a vote about this. Um, and it was a close call, uh, I believe. Um, but in the end, they rejected the possibility for transnational lists. So within the next European elections, it's still not able to really vote uh, on, uh, on, on true European parties or transnational lists, but still only on uh, national uh, uh, politicians, which is a bit strange. It's, it would be the same as in the Netherlands. You would only be able to vote uh, for uh, uh, a list of Groningen. Uh, instead of uh, um, uh, the, the, a, a national list. Do I answer your question with that, uh, Sim? Yes, you did. Thank you. Cool. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, then we have a question from Hannah Griffin, um, who would also like to ask it herself. Yeah, I wanted to get your perspective on the idea of Fortress Europe and essentially ask, do you believe there is a fortress Europe and if so, how can we help ensure that asylum seekers and migrants can enter the EU safely? And if you believe it doesn't exist, why? Uh, okay, um, I think um, uh, at this moment, uh, the way we deal with uh, refugees and asylum seekers is, is a terrible way of doing it. I mean, yeah, I. I believe there is a fortress uh, Europe uh, and also the way uh, we uh, keep uh, the people in camps in, uh, at the Greece borders is, uh, as we mentioned before, uh, it's, it's, it's a disgrace. Uh, even after the Moria fire, um, the Dutch government uh, wasn't willing to take on more than 100 uh, refugees uh, with a lot of uh, butts and uh, whatever. And they even uh, said, OK, but then another 100 refugees are not able to come. Um, so I think we should really change that. And one of the ways to do that, of course, is um, to ensure that there are legal pathways into Europe um, to ensure that uh, people can ask for asylum already um, uh, or um, see if they can work through legal pathways in, in the country that they are living in. Um, so that uh, they do not have to uh, make um, the, the terrible runs that they have to do through the desert or over the sea, uh, but that they are able to to get in a different way to Europe. I think that's very important. Yeah, and I think I agree. I, th I think one of the 
things that nobody ever really imagined when they started to talk about a single market and free movement within is that that by definition means that there isn't free movement from without, you know, and, and we probably didn't think, which is foolish given the history, we, we didn't think of large movements of people. Um, you know, we, we probably still thought of the Mediterranean as a barrier rather than as a conduit. Um, we didn't think that, you know, the way we dealt with Turkey and so on would be a, would be an option to this. So, so Fortress Europe, by definition, does exist to a certain extent because there are restrictions. I mean, we are, it's, it, it'll be very, very interesting in Britain to see what the move from free movement means in Britain to basically saying that everybody from every part of the, from the world, in theory, has the same right to, to enter the country. Um, because all of a sudden it would appear that our targets that we set in terms of refugees and asylum seekers have fallen off and everyone's gone, actually, we need more people. Um, you know, and I can't believe that as a continent, Europe struggles uh, to accommodate the people it, it, it takes in. Um, you know, it doesn't seem to me that every country has the same arguments, but it seems there is a, there's a debate that's allowed to happen that the pressure builds in one city or one country, and that is picked on by populist politicians in that country. Um, but I can understand it, it's a difficult one to have a, a European policy on because it looks like you're enforcing member states to do something. And I think this is, although I slightly disparage the, the agency creation that the EU is undertaking in creating an agency for absolutely everything so they can give something to each member state. Finland gets an agency and, you know, everybody gets an agency. But th this is something that could have been done in a non-governmental way, I think. You could have had applications going through a central body that then, you know, was in contact with the, with the interior departments of each country. But um, it, it by, yeah, by definition, Fortress Europe exists. And anybody who finds that unpleasant which it is, but in some ways, um, needs to determine what they mean as an alternative if they're also talking about the free movement of goods, services, people and capital around the continent. And I think also within Europe, there, there's sometimes the feeling with people that uh, a lot of refugees are, are coming to Europe, but I mean, still, I believe around 90% of the refugees are, uh, uh, are uh, being uh, in the region itself. So, um, and one of the other interesting things that we've seen over the past few years is that, uh, and especially in the past year also, is that there are a lot of cities within Europe that are saying we are willing and we are able to take on more refugees, um, but they are not being allowed by the countries. Um, and, and this, uh, well, gives some strange energy between those two. So I'm very interested also to see how that will develop. For example, Damian in the European Parliament, who is very, um, uh, he's working on this topic, which is in very uh, dearly, um, is also mapping out now which cities are willing and able to uh, put on the refugees to, to show, okay, Europe, there are a lot of Europeans that are more than willing to ensure that this disgrace is stopping. Yeah, and again, depoliticize it. I mean, yeah. I, I'm sitting in, a, as I say, in a country that is, Scotland is 4% ethnically diverse at the moment. And it's a big, empty country. You know, we have plenty of room for people who want to come and live and make their lives here. Um, but, you know, that is not how it feels. And I understand that's not how it feels in the southeast of England. Um, so, you know, take it away from the political level and, and get it into a more... I don't mean economic level, that sounds horrible and hard nosed that you'll only come if you have a valid right. People also need to be reminded. And it's odd again that Europe, the home of the European Convention of Human Rights forgets these things, that asylum and refugee applies a very specific status to you. And we, Britain, we do it, but I'm sure that it happens elsewhere that we over too easily blur asylum and refugee issues into economic migrants and these kind of things. I fully agree with you there. Um, but yeah, I, Hannah, I hope your question was answered. All right. 
then I would say uh, thank you very much. There is no more audience questions, so we'll end the evening here. Uh, but I thoroughly enjoyed it. Um, and I, gathering from the faces I can see in front of me that others did as well. Um, before you go, and before we end it, I just want to ask both of you whether you have any final remarks, any final pieces of advice, comments you can share with the SIB and with our audience. Um, when it comes to things on European uh, level, on the European Parliament, uh, do you have any, any, any remarks which can bring us hope in these trying times? Well, I think this evening uh, already uh, brings a lot of hope. I mean, uh, young people that are debating about uh, the future, about the way Europe is working, about things that can be improved, about uh, migrants, about uh, equal pay. Uh, I mean, those are all topics that, that I believe that we uh, uh, as a, a generation uh, that, that is moving forward really should debate together. And I think um, that's that inspires me all the time to see people uh, thinking about how can we improve the world that we are in. Uh, and and uh, I sometimes, uh, <laughs> I, I think I stole the quote from someone else, but I, I like to uh, uh, reiterate it. I mean, uh, change is not one big uh, leap, uh, a step ahead of uh, uh, in the future. It's, it's every day moving one step uh, further. And um, I mean, that's uh, also why I enjoy uh, enjoyed this evening very much. And I think together um, we will move in the right directions as long as we are willing also to sacrifice some free time uh, once in a while to ensure that we are heading in, the, in that direction and not wait till uh, others do it for us. So um, that's uh, something that I would also would like to give away to you. Um, uh, take uh, the control of your own future. Um, and, and, and ensure that um, um, you spend some time on it. Thank you. And John, do you have any words for us? Yeah, I mean, I echo all of that, obviously. Um, I, I have enjoyed it for, 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 a, for a, somebody sitting in a Brexit country, it's been a very uplifting evening, <laughs> I tell you. We don't get many of them right now. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think, I, I had a boss in Brussels who's, rather glib slogan used to be never underestimate the amount you can achieve as long as you're prepared not to take the credit for it. And I think Europe has an element of that. There is so much that can be done if it's not done in terms of a national point scoring or we're doing better than the United States or we're doing better than somebody else kind of thing. And I think the opportunities for people in Europe are represented by that. It's not just about political representation with you know, we've, we've both been candidates in one way or another. Um, but, you know, there are so many other ways in which influence and which change can be um, undertaken. And that's where I think, sadly, my country has hugely underestimated the importance of intercooperation. That if you make people mix, if you allow ideas to mix, if you make companies be international and so on and so forth, there's an interchange of ideas that just does not happen in other parts of the world. My, I know South America very well. South America has tried free trade areas and all sorts of communities. There's nothing like the level of understanding there. In, a, in what is a, a very self-contained continent, it ought to work perfectly, but it just isn't because nobody's ever had the guts to step beyond. And admittedly, they didn't have the Second World War that made them do it, but because we've, we've had that tragedy, now is the opportunity to keep going and saying, when disasters happen, as they happen, refugees, pandemics, whatever, we have the facility to deal with them. But equally, when opportunities come along, we also have the flexibility to deal with them too. And I, I, in that respect, I think Europe is, is still the best example that we've ever come up with in modern politics. And I will say that to my dying day, whatever part of the European Union I end up in. Thank you very much. Um, those are some good, really hopeful words for us. For me, it was also a hopeful evening uh, coming from someone who reads the news regularly in this. So it's always refreshing um, to have a discussion like this where you can um, see, see some, bright, some bright parts of our future. Uh, but with that, I'd like to end the evening here. Um, and thank you very much both for your, uh, fr yeah, your fruitful contributions to our debate, to discussion. Um, and I hope that possibly someday we could speak again after Corona and everything is over. Um, 
And yeah, th thank you very much for your words of advice, both of you. Um, if we were at a usual sub evening, I would now hand over a bottle of wine and a, bo and a bottle opener and say a thank you gift, but sadly that will just have to be resorted to a book voucher for uh, your contributions to the sub. Um, I will just shortly give an overview of upcoming events, but if you have somewhere you need to be, uh, please do head off um, because the evening will end here. We'll have some post discussions, but nothing formal anymore. Um, so with that, thank you um, to our speakers. Thank you to our audience. Thank you to those watching on YouTube. Uh, please tune in tomorrow evening. We have a discussion on COVID-19 in the Global South as our opener to a conference on Wednesday, but the starter is having tomorrow evening at 8 p.m. Uh, so please be there for it, and then please be there the day after as well. Um, furthermore, we have some events coming up with SIB itself. These are more so uh, fun and social and interactive than um, formal and intellectual. Um, but please do go to our website, go to our Facebook, go to our social media, stay updated and uh, see what's happening. If you're from SIB this Friday, we have uh, one of our board members' birthdays. So join us at uh, 1 p.m. Um, to just have a more casual hangout and conversation. Maybe we can have a discussion about this evening as well. Uh, but yeah, with that, thank you very much for coming, everyone. And um, this is the end of our evening. <laughs>